Hi, everyone. Welcome. 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 We're just waiting for everyone to get in the room. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Just giving it a minute or two. Allowing everyone to populate in. So we're still just waiting for people to get in the room. Thank you, all, all of you who are already here. Okay, we'll go ahead and start. So welcome to Lambda Lit Fest 2020 and our first night, Black Joy. My name is Cynthia Guardado and I am the event producer for Lambda Lit Fest. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards of the lands we are collectively standing on. We show gratitude to the Tongva people past and present for caring for this place that was stolen from them and that we not now call Los Angeles and vow to help the Tongva gain federal recognition and autonomy. Please take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral people and land you are currently on by sharing their names in the chat. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Lambda Lit Fest presents Black Joy. My name is William Johnson and I'm the deputy director of Lambda Literary. And I'm thrilled to be your host for the first night of this year's Lit Fest, a week long celebration of black LGBTQ artistry. This year's Lit Fest features some of our community's most dynamic performers for a series of conversations on art making, happiness, 
and how to dismantle a white supremacist, ableist, cisgendered, heteronormative world. To see a full list of events, visit landaliterary.org. We also want you to know that a closed caption reading of tonight's events tonight's event will be made available on our YouTube channel by the end of the month. Before we begin tonight, I want to thank LitFest event producer, Cynthia Gardardo, for everything they have done over the past few months to bring LitFest to life. It was a lot of heavy lifting. Thank you, Cynthia. As a small LGBTQ arts nonprofit, we are very grateful to our supporters. This year's LitFest is funded in part by an arts grant from the city of West Hollywood, as well as support from the California Arts Council and the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. You know, books have always been central to queer people's lives, which is why I'm proud to be a part of Lambda Literary. There is no organization like this one. We lift up queer voices all year round through programs like the Lambda Literary Awards, which is the most prestigious prize for LGBTQ books, we also bring books into schools so queer kids can see themselves reflected in the books they read. And we prepare future generations of queer writers by offering residencies and workshops for LGBTQ writers. These programs and others are made possible through the generosity of people like you. I know times are tough for many of us right now, but if you are able to make a donation tonight, however small or large, please do. We've set up a special code to make it easier. You can give directly from your phone by texting LITFEST. Again, text LITFEST to 44321. That's LITFEST to the 44321. Like many people and organizations, we are facing significant financial challenges as an organization, and donations are, of any amount are deeply appreciated. Also, I want to remind folks to join the conversation in the chat and let you know that there will be an, and I wanna let you know there will be an audience Q&A session at the end of the general discussion. So please drop any of your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I would like to invite tonight's moderator, Roger Mason, who is a former Lambda Fellow. Roger is also an award-winning writer, performer, and educator known for using history's lens to highlight the biases that separate rather than unite us. I will now turn the mic over to Roger. I am getting chills right now. I'm getting chills because William, you, from, from the day that I met you, you were just a, a tremendous source of black joy for me. And as a young writer, you know, it, it's so important to have possibility models and mentors for the journey ahead. And the experience that I personally had as one of the fellows of Lambda Lit a couple of years ago was like none other. And it truly did, I think, turn the tide for my work for the better. My name is Roger Q. Mason. I am a writer performer. I'm based currently in uh, Santa Monica, California. And I am, want to say, first of all, that there's a little sticker on uh, one of the streets, I think it was Main Street, that I saw that uh, St. Monica, after whom Santa Monica is named, was an African woman. So I just want to start there because I think that I'm on a ground that is named after a woman of African descent and that was inhabited by the Tongva people long before um, certain factions and forces made it their own. Today, we're going to talk about joy particularly Black joy, which is a subject that's very dear to my heart. We're going to discuss how Black joy is vital to the health of Black LGBTQIA communities and how happiness can be celebrated in and through Black art. Now, I got to do a little housekeeping because, child, I got to keep myself together, plus everybody else, too. We're going to have a conversation um, it'll be in two parts. The first part will be about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll have a five minute break for folks to do what they need to do. We'll pick back up from where we left off with that conversation. And then at the end, we're gonna open it up for Q&A. And um, I know that there's a chat box for Q&A specifically, and um, I will be encouraging folks a couple of times to make sure they engage because this is the house of joy. 
and we can't do it alone. We need you to be in this joy with us. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. And as I say their names, I, I don't know if y'all are muted or not, but go ahead and unmute so that we can start hearing you. First, I want to introduce Nasir Kenneth Faraby. Nasir is a Los Angeles-based television producer, filmmaker, activist, and public speaker. Next, we have Jordan J, who is a community organizer, arts advocate, producer, director, and the founder and direct, executive director of the Black Trans Femmes in the Arts Collective, BTFA is the um, just shorter name. I think it's called an acronym. Lord, I'm in a literary fest and don't know. Here we go. I also want to introduce George M. Johnson, they, them, who is a award-winning writer, activist, and best-selling author of All Boys Aren't Blue. And then I want to finally introduce Nicole Shawan Jr., she, her, and... Um, and she is a Black, queer, and poverty-born counter-storyteller who was bred in the, let me get this right because I love this when I read it, was bred in the bass, heavy beat, and scratch of Brooklyn, where the cool of beautiful inner city life barely survived crack cocaine's burn. Come on. And for those that I did not introduce you by your pronouns, please forgive me. And if you'd like to do so, I invite that. But welcome all of you. How y'all doing? So happy to be here amongst <laughs> communities. So happy to be in the, in the presence, right? In the embrace of Black joy, right? In particular, Black joy. So thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I second that for sure. Thank you so much for having us. So I want to start here because, you know, we need to just do a check-in, y'all. What do y'all bring into this room? What, what was your day like? What are you feeling macro and micro at this moment? It can be anything. And we don't need to call names out. Y'all can just go and talk, child. Because we, we need to get sorted out before we get started. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, yes. Monday, was, Monday was certainly Monday. Um, you know, you start out the day with a schedule and before you know it, the schedule has become somebody else's schedule. Oh. Um, but I will say today was actually a really, really, um, good day, um, around the book, mm. stuff with the book. Um, I'm working on developing a television show with Gabrielle Union, um, around the book. And so there was some movement today on that. Um, so that was really, really amazing. Um, and then I also found out that the book, because uh, I did the audio book, and I found out that Macmillan chose it and submitted it for consideration for the Best Spoken Word album at the Grammys. So what? that was yeah. really, really, like, crazy to find out, because um, you, you don't know until you know, like, and yeah. basically someone DM'd me who I guess has a ballot and was like, Oh, I found out about you because your, you know, your book is on the Grammy ballot. And I was like, my book is on the Grammy ballot. <laughs> and, and so then it started like a text chain, like with editors, like, wait, what's happening? And then we finally figured out that um, I was chosen by Macmillan as one of the books they submitted. So That is amazing. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I am getting chills right now. I'm literally actually getting chills. We're going to have to turn on a heater in here, child. <laughs> it's, getting, it's too much. That's amazing, George. Thank you for sharing that. Congrats on you, man. Congrats. That's amazing. Thank you. Who else got something? Who gonna top that? Come on. <laughs> I don't know. Please. Ain't no topping that. Congrats, George, because that's dope. That's beyond dope. Ain't no topping it. Well, um, I, I, Jordan topped it with the beat and the hair and the hey, top everybody. I got I logged in and I was like, well, I thought I was doing something. I was like, well, damn. All that. My little thermal on, like, okay. Jordan, <laughs> definitely, Jordan definitely came ready for the for the lit fest. Oh my God, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I had to freshen myself up. I woke up it's like, well, actually woke up at 4.30 this morning to fly back to New York from Florida. I was visiting my family and also um, I had to go home because there was a Black Trans Lives Matter rally in my hometown, which I never mm. I would see in a million years. So I had to risk all of the health and also the difficulty of being home with family just to 
be able to see that in my hometown. It was really amazing. I'm still riding on the coattails of that Black joy. Awesome. Wow. Kudos to you. Kudos to you. Wow. I have questions about that. We're going to come back to that moment in a little bit. But we, we'll keep it moving. But I want to come back to that for sure. Who else? Where? Where? Who? Where? Mm. Yeah, Nasty, you gonna do it? I mean, for, uh, my my day was incredibly productive, actually. Yeah, yeah. I um, you know, woke up, did a quick meditation, then I mm. read a script that I've been meaning to read for the past you know week, and so I can send those to my writer. Then I had a shoot for my job, and then I came home and prepped for this. So it's been it's been a it's been a really productive day. Um, it was a really relaxing weekend. I, I shut out all of the noise of the um, political stuff that's happening. And I just, mm -hmm. I, I, I watched and read the highlights of it and, and let, let the rest sort of be, uh, you know, I let peace be still for myself. So I've been, you know, practicing a lot of self-care. So it's been good. It's been a beautiful day and I'm excited to be here. So yeah, it's been good. I really love that. I, I love the idea of leaving the low lights to everybody else. All you did was listen to the highlights and your exactly. week was, I mean, we cannot be holding space for some of this madness. Listen, I, I'm not finna, yeah, yeah, they're not finna have no. any panic mm -mm. attack. I'm not gonna do it. Not on my watch, no. Mm -mm. This can't be disturbing your sleep. We still got principles and standards, child. And we all gotta look good. So and we all, and we all gotta be together, you know? Yeah. I mean, cause. Mm. <laughs> Nicole, what's happening? Yeah, I, you know, much like Nasir, I'm definitely um, trying just to capture what I need to capture from this um, debacle of uh, a presidency. Um, but be that as it may, um, I think for me, it's a bit more complicated. And I wish I can say that I'm as firmly rooted, right, all day, every day, um, or even today in that joy. I think I'm still carrying the fact that we're in a pandemic. I've been li living out of my suitcase for a month um, in order to quarantine and then visit with my mother and my fiance's mother. Mm. Um, and just also dealing with the racism inherent to the medical industrial complex um, over the past month or so has also been something that's been a bit um, triggering and debilitating, but also like giving me um, uh, uh, another cause to, um, you know, address through nonfiction writing. So that is happening, right? But while that's happening, there is a conscientious, like intentional um, grounding in joy, right? Because even though my mom is aging and I think has aged um, severely because of and during the pandemic, I still mm -hmm. have a mom. I have a mom to love on and fuss with um, and care for, right? Um, my fiance has a mom. Her mom has been isolated um, by herself alone, literally for the past six or seven months, however long this thing has been playing out. And mm -hmm. we're able to visit with her mom and love on her mom, right? My, her, my fiance lost her dad last year. So just like remembering, recognizing that like, the things that may be mundane, right? Or the things that we may take for granted are in fact the things that we should be finding joy in. We worked out together um, this morning for 35 minutes. You know, we huffed and puffed and grunted through it, but we did that, you know? And like we had um, the ability to like watch a video and work out to that video and do it amongst each other. Um, so yeah, those are the things that I'm coming with. I'm coming with a deep sense of anxiety and you know, just, I think trepidation around what's about to happen, especially when we have someone in the White House who is telling people to um, go watch the polls and, um, you know, stand by when he doesn't give up the White House, when he doesn't walk out. While that's happening, there's also these other kind of like moments where I can say, hey, like I'm around Black folks, I'm around community, and there is a reason to be joyful because I'm living, despite living in an anti-Black world, I'm thriving. Mm. You just wrote an essay right now. I am so glad that it was recorded because that was just poetry, truth and poetry. I mean, that what I think is so significant about what you just said is that there are certain geopolitical factors that we really can't control. But what we can do is we can find those moments of joy for ourselves and within our, within our little worlds. And I think more than anything, what's happened in this pandemic is we've learned to really embrace those worlds wholeheartedly and fully because that's all we have, really. 
the world may be burning and going to shit, but like you said, I still have a mom to love on and fuss with. That's power. So I, I love the, the, the sentiment of familial closeness and intimacy and enjoyment of the little things that you're talking about. That 35 minute video, that opportunity to just be in community with someone that you love and care about and do something that is nourishing for your relationship as well as for your individual and collective body. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the webinar. We done. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. We don't need to say no more. Nicole brought up, but I mean, I guess that brings me to my first, my first question for the group, which is how can we define black joy? What, what, what do we name it? What do we call it? How do we define it? Freedom, mm. you know, uh, un un unconditional freedom, which it is still not prevalent yet. It's not president. It's not prevalent in our in our in our justice system. It's not present. It's not prevalent in the laws. It's not. It's not. It's just. It's just not. Um, so we still have a long way to go. But I think you know, freedom and contentment, and um, and and having the having the right to live fully and abundantly mm. uh, without compromise, you know, having the true essence of what equality is supposed to mean, you know, but, you know, until that is, yeah, you know, until that is, you know, sort of uh, implemented, we have to capture our own joy through, you know, self-care, through finding contentment, through therapy, through self-work, through love, um, so, you know, right now, Black joy is still very much, it's all on us. Mm, but wasn't it always? Yeah. I mean, I mean that. a world as systematically oh. disinterested in our humanity, let alone our joy, we've always relied on ourselves and each other to find joy. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, what our, that's what our music is. That's what our, what our literary work is. That's what our art is, I, I would say. And yes, we did catch that Freudian slip. It's not in our president. He said that at a certain point. <laughs> I caught that. I, was, I heard I that. Even, I wasn't even trying to do all that. You weren't even trying to do it. But you, I was to you, but you know, you know, the, the, the spirit kind of led that out. But you know, I, that, was, that wasn't me, though. <laughs> Lord. That was spirit. That wasn't me. Oh my God. I can't, but yet I will. <laughs> so everybody else, what is what is black joy for you? For me, it's about moving beyond a pursuit of survival and oh. in a world that tells us that we aren't allowed to survive and mm -hmm. find those moments where we get to relish in our own desire and our mm -hmm. own in our own personhood and what does that look like when that part of ourselves is fulfilled beyond trying to meet the requirements of what we're given to survive with. Mm. I was listening to Audre Lorde yesterday because um, I was going on another podcast and it was that that great essay that she gives on the erotic versus the pornographic mm -hmm. and how the erotic is about how I define joy you know for my own self, in my own world, on my own terms, not for someone else's pleasure or not at my expense to pleasure somebody else, but what do I want, you know? And I love this idea of, of finding a joy that you can define on your own terms, but all, more importantly, God damn, surviving. How do we move past only surviving? Mm -hmm. I feel like we're always like one one millimeter away from surviving or not surviving, when can we actually just be at peace as black queer bodies? <laughs> Oops, uh -huh. look, at that. look at me doing it. I mean, look at me. Mm -mm. Jordan, see, see what we did? Okay, we supposed to talk about joy. So, joy. <laughs> I think um, for B, it's especially with a lot of the research I've been doing lately, it's, um, it's like the denial the denial that we're property of the state. And it's mm -hmm. like, like we know that, right? Like, I know I'm still property of the state. I know that 
my ancestors were by law property of the state and then laws changed and then they pretended like they gave us humanity, but that we never stopped being property of the state. But I think about, for my ancestors, I think about, well, what happened when the lights went out at the master's house? Mm. Um, because in th the only way that they were able to pass down the traditions, it couldn't have been in front of them. So there had to be moments where they taught the dance and that they taught the history and that they taught the lessons and that they passed it down. And so for me, I find joy in that because I think about that. And so I think about how when someone writes this chapter who will probably be a white person, it will talk about the police brutality, but it won't talk about the verses. It won't talk about how much joy we all have when we watch verses, but, but what we will see and what they will capture is how, how they continue to beat us. And so I think about that. I think about how our joy came in the moments that they can't see. And I think about how our joy, especially Black joy, rests in the imaginative. Because no matter what you do to my body, you can't do that to my mind. You cannot get into my imagination. and You cannot stop where my imagination goes. And you can't stop the utopia that I can create in my mind. And you can't stop the worlds that I can create with my words, with the stories that I write, and with the things that I do. And so for me, that is where I personally find joy. And I think that's where many of us find joy is and I think that's why they call it like daydreaming, right? Like, honestly, daydreaming to a Black person means so much more because that's a utopia and that's a place that they can't touch. And that's the place that they have not been able to find a way to touch, no matter how much in artificial intelligence they create, no matter what they do, the place they cannot touch is, is my daydreams and my dreams and my imaginative and the things that I, I the liberation that I can imagine for myself outside of a carceral state. Um, mm. That's what black joy in my opinion looks like and i think more of us need to invest in the imaginative because if you can invest in the imaginative then you can invest in abolition you can invest in because abolition is the imaginative anyway mm. and so i think those two things uh, connect and i think that's actually where a lot of our joy resides i can retire and go away but now that i have heard that i don't that is the only advice that i I mean, literally, George, that, that is such a, pro I, there are so many profound things that you just gave us right now, this gift of an answer. First of all, when are masses lights going, going to go off? That, that's one. And what do we do when they go off? And what do we do to bide the time before they go off? Second of all, I love this idea of the transcendence of the Black queer imagination. An imagination that has always been made invisible or discounted or discredited, yet somehow it survives. Particularly the Black queer imagination is something that has made a way out of no way. We have been told that we are three-fifths of a person, we have been told that we are not eligible for medical care during various pandemics, not just this one. We have been told that we are not eligible for the same rights and liberties and tax advantages of heteronormative bi binary affirming couples. And yet somehow we have still made art. Somehow we have still completely revolutionized music somehow we are visual artists, somehow we are playwrights, somehow we are actors. All of these things happen because we have completely shut out no. We've turned no into an invitation to find yes somewhere else and that somewhere else is in our minds and our spirits. That cannot be stolen from the black queer metaphysical body. I, be, I really believe our greatest form of artistic expression is how we transcend, how we take no and make it an invitation to find yes somewhere else, starting with our own self-love. I, I think you said it. Like, I think we, like you just said, we, we revolution all. We, we, we are the revolution of it all. Like we, we started, we're the jumping off point. So, you know, whether it be uh, Bayard Rustin during the civil rights movement or whether it be, uh, whether whether it be uh, you know the 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 influence of uh, voguing, 
during the early 90s. You gotta name the receipts, name the receipts, come through. Or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, Marsha P. Johnson during, during Stonewall. It's like, you know, we as Black LGBTQ plus people, we, we, we started we, because we're also, we're, we're often the most marginalized. And when you're, mm. when, when you're marginalized to the point of like your back is up against the wall, you know, sometimes you got to throw the brick, literally, you know, mm -hmm. like you got to throw the brick and be like, you know, you're not going to put me up against the wall. And it's sort of like, we're just going to, we're just going to come out, you know, uh, hand swinging and, and guns blazing. So I think the reason why we're often put into those places to, to be leaders is because we don't really have a choice but to, because who else is going to do it for us, but us, mm. you know, okay. like, it's like, it's, we're, our, our, our beauty, our culture, our life force is, is often hijacked, even amongst us, mm. you know, like even, even amongst us, it's, it's often hijacked. So we have to always be willing to fight for our joy and fight for our freedom. I just, I mean, amongst us, we're going to come back to that. I kind of feel, yeah, I feel like, oh, I'm so happy for this because this conversation is so connected. Um, Nasir, thank you for that, George and Jordan as well. I feel like when it comes to Black queer folks, um, what we have, I don't know if I want to say perfected, I, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think what we've really tapped into are the myriad of ways that we um, can and should navigate and embrace spirit, mm. both personal spirit and collective spirit. And mm. I think when you have figured out how to tap into that or when spirit has vice gripped you, you Ooh. have no choice but to live your, live your life in a joyful, um, passion-driven way. Um, and so I think that in many ways is our privilege and pleasure as Black queer folks is to be so connected to spirit both, both individually and as a collective and thereby producing all of this joy that we're producing, right? It really isn't us. Mm. We really are vessels for this. Mm. Um, yes. But because of the spirits that we are, the power of our spirit, right? We have to unleash it. There's no way of holding that back. Mm. I would say um, white, white people have forefathers and black people have ancestors and that means something. I say, oh. Come on. I say, oh, you don't have a word. Because you can tap into your ancestors. And I, I, I believe in ancestor veneration. I have an altar set up in my closet to my ancestors. I talk to them in the morning before I start my day. I talk to them every Sunday night. I give them water. I, I do all of those things because she, that's 100% correct, is the fact that like we are vessels of our ancestors. And so much of what we are doing, especially as Black queer folk, I feel like we are, we are the in many ways, like, like you said, like the voices that were stolen, right? It's like, we should have been able to learn about Marsha P. Johnson when we were in school and they stole mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Then the queer people who we did learn about, they stole their identities. And so when we learned about Langston Hughes, we didn't know Langston was one of us. And when right. we learned about Zora, we didn't learn, we didn't know Zora was one of us. We didn't learn that until we got older. And then what we then did as the vessels of them was now these kids know about us. And you can't take that part from us. And so in many ways, when we found joy knowing that we had ancestors, the kids who now see us have joy immediately because they know that they have people living with them. They get to live and touch and see and speak to the people who will one day be ancestors, the people on this panel who do the work now. And I think that's that's that spiritual like connection, right? Because again, there was a denial that we even existed but, mm. Like I always say, you can't deny we exist and make laws against us at the same time. So you had to know we existed in order for you to make a law against us. Sure so you then did everything in your power to not only deny the existence, but then make laws against the existence. But now mm. you can't deny the existence. You can't deny the word. You can't deny what we do. And you can't deny that. I have always had this feeling that we are the most important people because as queer people we are the embodiment of everyone mm. and because come on now george, george come on now george. come on now george yeah. come on 
on now. I'm done. I'm done. Everyone. And, and, and I say this like, and because people always ask me like, why? Like I, I go by they, them, but people have always asked me like, do you get offended if somebody messed up your pronouns? I say no. And they're like, well, why? I said, well, if I'm sitting with a, a black woman and she said, girl, that means that I'm a reflection of girl to her. And that's fine. Oh. If I'm sitting with a, a, a dude, he's like, yo, that's my bro. That's fine. Because that means to, to him, I am a reflection of bro. Mm -hmm. And if I'm sitting with someone who who is a they them like myself mm. and see a they them like themselves, that means I'm a reflection. But that also makes us the most powerful beings because people can be reflected in us, like people mm. in us and then are reflected in us. And I feel that is why Black queer people have been able to sustain what we've sustained and sustain the things that they've tried to deny us. But why we continue to still be the creators and the curators of the culture in many ways. Mm. And let me say, let me, oh, I, mm, let me say this. If we are the reflection of everyone, we are the reflection of everything they want, everything they covet, everything they desire, everything they fear, everything they don't want us to know that they are too, any, everything that they want secretly. When masses lights are out and we're downstairs or outside having all of these fantasies played on us, appropriated from us, so that they can have some semblance of freedom and transcendence that we have naturally. We destroy norms. It, like there's no such thing as a norm for us. We are the we are the original abolitionists because mm -hmm. we 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 already existed outside of what they had created as a as a norm. And so I think that that's exactly right. That's why so many, when they see what we do, it's like, well, why do you get to live so abundantly and boldly? Why can't I do the same thing? And it's like, well, you can do the same thing. It's just that we have abolished the constructs that y'all put on us and we unlearned what you told us. We, we, the only things that you told us that we could be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, many people have said this, but Deshaun Harrison, I think was one of the, one of the people who, who said it, it was like, you know, like, basically like to be queer is like to choose your, your happiness over your safety in many ways. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do every day as queer people. We choose happiness over safety and we choose joy. Like that moment of joy of us being ourselves, even though we know that could come with, with uh, the attack and, and the harm and the violence and potential death of the physical being, um, we still choose happiness over that because happiness to us looks different. And so we still choose our joy whatever it is as small as it may be that that bit that we get to choose that's what we do um yeah and, and i think to sum up your question that's what black joy is <laughs> jordan jordan we've got we, I, you've been in a, you've been receiving all of this this black joy magic but i want to get you in here real quick to just give us a few words on black joy before we go to commercial George was saying, that I always say that our willingness to choose to live openly, to love ourselves, to believe that we can and should be loved, to believe that we can and are be can be and are beautiful in a world that tells us that we are not is the most radical or imaginative act that anyone can take. And that is why we are so dangerous. That is why we are so feared because our existence and our willingness to commit to our existence undoes the state. It unravels mm everything that it is built upon. And so we must be eradicated in our willingness to fight and to choose to not be eradicated and to choose to continue to survive and love every single day is a radical act of abolition, is a radical Ooh. act of that enables us and empowers us to be able to be such radical and earth shattering creators. Okay, I am full. I am. Yeah, she said, "Undoes the state," and it hit me. She, I, you said, "Undid the state." I I Ooh. can't. I can't. You said, "Undo the state." Well, on that note, we're gonna go to commercial break. We'll be right back. <laughs> we're on intermission, folks, and we'll see you all back very shortly. This conversation is hot, 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 and I can't wait to continue it.
The Lambda Literary Award was awarded in 1989. The purpose of the awards in the early years was to identify and celebrate the best of lesbian and gay books in the year of their publication. What literature has always taught us is that only in tracing our individuality can we become universal. The awards gave national visibility to a literature that had established a firm, if nascent, beachhead through a network of dynamic, lesbian and gay publishers and bookstores springing up across America. Lambda Book Report, meanwhile, grew into a comprehensive review periodical, and together the review and the awards cemented the reality that a distinct, definable LGBTQ literature existed. The award ceremony has consistently drawn an audience representing every facet of publishing. The awards honor some two dozen categories reflecting the wide spectrum of LGBTQ books. From the very first year, the Lammies have made the statement that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender stories are part of the literature of the world. In 2007, Lambda Literary founded its Writers' Retreat for Emerging LGBTQ Voices, a residency designed to offer intensive and sophisticated instruction to selected writers over a carefully designed one-week period. The retreat is intended to fill a void in the development of LGBTQ writers offering instructive feedback in a supportive environment. I always say that I, I recognize myself as a, a person of color and as a queer person and as a writer. They've never really been brave enough to put all of those things together. And I think that coming here has really put all of those things together for me. In 2012, Lambda launched the LGBTQ Writers in School program, where queer writers visit K-12 classes or queer youth organizations to discuss LGBTQ literature with young people. In 2017, the first Lambda Lit Fest took place in Los Angeles, featuring a week of readings, discussions, workshops, and other performances across the city. With the clarified mission, Lambda Literary fully intends to earn its acknowledged position as the world's premier LGBTQ literary organization. Anne Herbert once said, we can cry for a thousand years or have an accurate laugh. My goal has always been to write that sentence that causes that accurate laugh. Uh, because brevity is the soul of wit, I thank you so much for this award. Thank you. If you could all return to your seats. All right, I think we're back. So for those that may have just joined, and if you did just join, honey, you missed a holy show, but they've got a tape, so I'm sure you can see it later. But for those who just joined in, we are talking about Black Joy, and we are going to go into the next phase of this conversation, but we're going to do it by picking up where we left off. Jordan, I, for the last three minutes, this notion of undoing the state mm. through our existence, through the resistance of our existence, that notion has just rung through my body. Every sinew, every cell, every atom in my body is just electrified by this notion of just by being who we are, we can undo the state. Can we continue that conversation? Can we keep, pick up where we left off? And I guess I'll help us out by saying, how does our existence, our blissful, joyful existence as Black queer artists undo the state?
Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've said this before, um, statistics do not change laws and policies. Statistics do not overthrow systems, narratives do. Mm. And that's where we storytellers come in, right? It's through um, the rendering of our own personal narratives as well as the narratives of those who are similar, similarly situated to us um, that we bring light to the issues that are impacting us, hopefully to change legislation, to change policy, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's those documentaries about um, folks who are justice involved, right? It is the stories about folks who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated that ultimately is going to take down the prison industrial complex and the criminal injustice system, right? It's not just the reporting on the numbers of folks. We've been reporting on the numbers of folks who are locked up, the number of folks who are underserved for, you know, lifetimes, like that shit is tired mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. What does work is shining a light on the stories of the folks who are impacted by um, these various unjust systems of white supremacy. I mean, in a way, those are almost like the same. It, it, it's brilliant and it's sad what you're having to say to us because it's the same humanizing work that the, um, that the slave narratives had to do. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric is exactly the same. It's, I am a human being. I have feelings, hopes, and dreams like you. You should consider me socially, civically, and legally as ne needed to, ne as in need of your representation and consideration. Mm -hmm. So actually, we are in some ways at a standstill culturally, and in other ways, we've regressed because what you're suggesting quite brilliantly, Nicole, is that the work is not finished in terms of proving. Mm -hmm a centuries old myth, which is a fucking lie, that black people are three fifths of a person. We are still struggling with that notion in our legislation. They don't get it yet. I think that's an amazing point that you just made. I think the only difference, and it's quite nuanced, is that mm. when we're writing our stories, we're writing it for us. Like I don't write to convince white people to shit. Mm -hmm. I don't write to convince straight people of shit. What I do is I write to mobilize, right? And to say, hey, community, you are not alone. I've gone through this myself. We are going through this as a collective, right? Mm -hmm. And it's when you start to build community and, oh, I recognize my story in this narrative. Mm. Oh, Nicole is a felon. Oh, that gives me the power to say I'm a felon too. I've never really told nobody about that. Oh, you a felon too? Then let's get in this abolitionist shit. Mm -hmm. Let's get it, because I'm sure that your felony was poverty born inspired, right? Mm -hmm. But it's only when we're sharing our narratives that other folks will actually recognize that we are sharing the same stories. I'm mm -hmm. not waiting for anyone to free us. I'm mm -hmm. not waiting for anyone to dismantle their systems. What I'm saying is, let's free ourselves. Let's burn down this bitch. Come on with this Nat Turner. Come on. That's power. I mean, I love that. I love the idea of that, uh, of that pivot, which is that we're no longer using that rhetoric to join a white decision making conversation. We're using that rhetoric of humanizing to build a collective sense of our own humanity because we've bought into that myth ourselves and we need to be on that myth needs to be undone in us. That's power. How do we use art to undo the state. George, you bobbing your head. I, I feel it. I, you know they want to hear you right now. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, yeah, like using art to undo the state. I mean, Nicole hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, it really is about writing stories that do not center whiteness. Like, like I have no desire to write to white people. I, I say that all the time. When I wrote my book, my book does not center white people. It centers, it centers myself. It centers black folk and it, and what it does is like in many ways when I write black stories, I write with an empathy around black people. Mm. And I have no desire to punish you. I have no desire to to do the harm that the state has done to you, even if you were my abuser. And I know that's tough because that, that's a tough place to get to because I've been abused. I've been abused by many within community and many, you know and, and and folk and family and all of that, but. The state is what taught me to be carceral. The state is what told me that you needed a punishment because you did something to me. Mm. And so I have to undo that, right? And, and if I can undo that, then 
community can also uh, work to undo those same things. Um, I think it's interesting because again, when we write the story from our narrative, it always looks different. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is taking back the narratives that were already stolen from us and rewriting them from our lens, right? Mm -hmm. like, like Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemmings is not a love story. That was a young black girl who was raped by a president of the United States. Uh -huh. And somebody needs to write that. And it has to be one of us to say, I, I, actually what happened was a young girl was enslaved by one of your presidents and your your forefathers and was raped multiple times and had multiple children by by one of your presidents that is not some love story that was not some you know some some she fell in love with a no and and that but i think about that with every single story that comes out right mm -hmm. and so the art then when you're saying how do you undo the state you have to then look at every story through the lens of the fact that it was told to you as a lie Mm. The story that we know was told to us as a lie. And the only way that you undo that is to start unraveling those stories. And so it's interesting because, you know, people are always like, I'm tired of hearing slave narratives. I will never be tired of hearing slave narratives. I'm tired of <laughs> Thank you. But I'm tired of hearing the wrong slave narratives. I am tired of, of narratives that don't that don't talk about the slave, but talk about the slave's brutality. Huh. One of the biggest issues that I have is the fact that millions of my ancestors was, were enslaved and I can't name them. Mm -hmm. I can't name them. I can name Harriet Tubman. I can name Frederick Douglass. I can name the ones that white people wanted me to be able to name. Mm -hmm. I can't name the ones you didn't want me to be able to name. And that bothers me. And so part of when we talk about, well, how do we make our art undo the state, it is by naming the slaves. You can now no longer talk about how enslavement was just a, 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 a over, like a macro thing. No, mm -hmm. this is a micro thing. And these mm -hmm. people, our ancestors had names and mm -hmm. what y'all did to them, the stories of what y'all did to them need to be said, they need to be written, and they need to be documented by us. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you undo it through the art and like where we're at now is making sure that our art centers black folk right and and i'm gonna talk about it like i'm gonna talk about like queen and slim and that ending like i want to be very very clear like asada shakur is alive and because she's alive that's a possibility model for liberation mm. at some point we have to stop the idea that oh well we always die at the end no we don't because there's mm -hmm. a woman who is still alive who survived what the state tried to do to her right mm -hmm. think about how important the movie set it off is to me now mm. jada pinkett survived at the end and see, we all were taught to look at that as like, that's so sad. She lost all her friends and her family. No, she survived the state, a state that was unjust to all four of those women, a state that tried to kill all four of the women. They could not kill her. And she was alive at the end. And so I think about how powerful that narrative then becomes when we talk about undoing the state. Set it off as one of those movies and our art should start to inform in that way. Like, yes, you could look at it through one lens of, look at how much violence and this, and they all got killed, but they didn't. Look at what liberation looks like because somebody survived the state on her terms and she did it the way she needed to do it. Um, and when you think about that in real life, I think about Corin Gaines. She is the closest thing we have ever had to Nat Turner. Eventually mm -hmm. I will write about it, but Corin Gaines, the way that, you know, she was a, a victim of police brutality, but there is so much in that girl's story about how she was tired of what the state was doing to her and her child. And she said, if they got to take me out, they got to take me out, but I'm going to go against the state. And mm -hmm. I think about that all the time and it, how it informs the way that we have to write stories. Wow. 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 <laughs> I, we, we just going to take one second to just soak that in. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go to Nasir. You just popped up for me too. <laughs> what was the question? Um, I don't even know anymore. I don't even know what we're talking about. Um, How do we undo the state? How do we listen, undo the state? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you I'm, I'm, I'm entranced by George. I'm like, what? I'm like, go, go. I'm like, come on, George. Talk that talk, man. Nasir, do it. Tell us how does how does um, how does your art undo the state? Maybe we'll do it that way, more specifically to you. I think by just by staying brave enough to to live in my full truth 
mm. and to tell my full truth. Mm. You know, um, you know, so whether it be, you know, uh, writing a character who who's vulnerable, who, who cries or who's struggling mm. to, uh, you know, navigate a relationship with their father that they just met or whether it be uh, having a, writing a character who is, you know, falling in love for the first time and, and mm. finding the bravery for, the, bravery for that or just or being or you know as, as far as art you know art form you know being in a room where I, I do I may have a seat at the table and and saying actually you know what that's that's a black woman wouldn't say that or that's we're mm -hmm. actually going to cast that a little bit differently and we're we're not going to conform into the the nonsense of colorism and we're going to make sure we do uh, give this person an opportunity and this this project does need uh, a black female lead, and this 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 project does need um, a, a a a black trans woman as the lead, and 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 so I, I think maybe that's the way that 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 I can sort of um, I can sort of you know tap into my own power in mm -hmm. telling in telling those stories in a way that is authentic without compromise. And, I, you know, I yeah and that that you know it it, it sometimes it, it costs you know sometimes people are like well you know i don't you know that's that's too rich for my blood and I, i'm not you know i'm not climbing that mountain and you know i i want to you know i want this sort of writer this sort of director i want to tell i want to have these characters and it's like well you know what you're not for me then oh like, you're, not, you're not for me because over here we we uh we bought that life you know what i mean <laughs> and we bought <laughs> And we want to, and we want to be, we want, you know, I want to be a change maker. I have zero interest in doing the same old thing over and over and over again. So we're going to take your transphobia. We're going to take your homophobia. We're going to take your fat phobia. We're going to take your colorism. And you mm. gonna take that shit out the door with me. You know, mm. so, that, so that's the way that I, you know, advocate in my art. I love that. And I love the idea of, you using your seat at the table and and we all know what table you're talking about the the table of mass media which is still white cisgender male oriented largely and mm -hmm. you come into those spaces and through your presence your ideas and your bravery to challenge you completely undo the state because media is power what we project of ourselves or what gets projected of us is, is how people form opinions. Mm -hmm. Jordan, Absolutely. you know I got to come bring it back full circle because you the one started us on this, Chaz. So yeah, how do you use, listen, Go how ahead. do you use your art to undo the state? First, I want to touch on where this idea came to me from. It was from being in the clubs when I first turned 18 in New York City and seeing the Butch Queens and the Femme Queens Vogue. And I was like, this art form can't be contained. So, and so this art form does not fit within a carceral state. This is not an art form that can be policed or that can be put behind bars. To see an art that has its roots in the prison system, coming out of Rikers, coming out of people, looking at Vogue magazine while incarcerated and striving towards a femininity that mm. is outside of a carceral state mm. something that can't be contained within the carceral state. And so I was like, we really bust this whole shit open. Like there's no way you can tell me mm. that we can be contained and we can be imprisoned when we are creating the very art forms that are making prison impossible mm. within our lives. So the way that I use my art and my platform, because I would say I don't make art presently, is through opening the gates for those people who have been doing that mm. to do it on a larger stage and to do it in a way in which they control their own narrative, to mm. give people who have been creating the culture for decades, mm. that films who've been in the underground, who people have been looking to and stealing from oh. since the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s on the ballroom scene. Oh. Tell those people, you can do it up there. You can be in the front. 
and your voice deserves to be heard and watch what happens when your voice is heard. Okay, we, we just need a hand praise for that because literally you just gave us a whole lot of education right now. Many folks don't know about the connection between the prison system, trans bodies in male prisons, trans bodies in female prisons, misgendered. A lot of people don't know this and how Vogue was a form of protest. I'm thinking about gumshoe dances as protest. You taking me back to that. I mean, our bodies and how we express them artistically have many times had to be used for resistance and protest. I love that. And also, I just want to say to you, Jordan, that what you're doing now is art making too. Mm -hmm. Because creating space for the next generation, creating space for other queer, trans, gender non-conforming folks who may not feel culturally eligible to speak because they are so accustomed to silencing. That actually is art. And actually that brings me to a really interesting point, which is that this is, joy is intergenerational. Here we are, we've been going back to the ancestors. We're coming back here. We're dreaming the culture forward. There's a trans metaphysical navigation system that we're using to get to joy. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that you're touching on quite beautifully is that to whom much is given, much is expected in return. We are all people of letters. We know and value and understand and have carved space, fought for a space in the literary continuum. And we are here. But there's somebody, a young kid in Iowa City, a young child in Trinidad and Tobago, a young child, you know, in around the world, maybe someone in, in a foreign country, a war-torn country that feels like they have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And they don't yet have the words for it, or they feel that what they want to say is shameful. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help them find the joy of Black art for themselves? How can we transfer this joy to the next generation. And I'm talking about mentorship. I'm talking about all of it. St. Louis, somebody said. Somebody's shouting out Iowa City. Come on, Iowa City. I see y'all. <laughs> but yes. seriously, folks, I mean, because it really is us passing it on. And I'm wondering how we can encourage the next generation to find this joy. I would, I would say, you know, love them with wholeness and wellness. You know, and, and when you do have an opportunity to lift people up as you're climbing, uh, be an advocate for them and, and do it in a way that is truly healthy. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen a misuse in power in some in some instances within our community where, you know, there's sort of like a. a a, a, a praying on those who are and I mean, P.R.E.Y. Uh, not P R A Y, um, 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 on those that are younger, um, that are neglected, that are disenfranchised, that are kicked out of their homes. So I would say when you when you come across those people, those 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 young ones who slide in your DMs and they need advisement and they need to figure out an affirming church to go to and they mm -hmm. need to figure out what dance class can they take and they you know I, I I've seen it personally with you know men like Nathan Hell Williams and Emma Wilberkin who have you know who uh, and DeAndre Gosford and Quincy, Quincy Lanier who have you know taken me under their wing especially with Nathan in particular where it's you know hey you know you know, these are your notes for your script. And, and, uh. and this is the church that you go to, you know, go to this church in Harlem, go to this church in LA. This is a place where you'll be affirmed and you're safe here. So I would say um, the biggest way to mentor those that are further disenfranchised is to, is to create a safe and affirming space for them where uh. they can come to you without expecting, where they don't have to give anything in return. Uh. Selfless, selfless, yeah. fully, fully selfless, and and you know, and I I've been so fortunate that I've experienced that, um, and 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 I try my best to do the same, and 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 if we all, 
operate together in that space, then, then, you know, then, then we're pretty unstoppable. One thing I, I do want to add, um, just uh, going back to a little bit about the Vogue community and the Vogue and the Vogue houses. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, in terms of mentoring and this sort of ties in, it's so important that we figure out a way where they can properly, you know, economically benefit from their art form. Thank you. You know, like they themselves, where it's not hijacked by networks and production companies and, and people who, I'm just keeping it real, and yep. people who, you know, don't really create the art. Um, but the people, you know, the, the I'm, I'm friends and I love the people that, that are, you know, the the house of Lanvan and the house of uh, Miss Rahi and the house or or the house of Ninja and it's time it's far overdue for them to be able to economically support themselves and support their generations because they mm. they created that art form and did it beautifully and the, and they are not properly supported and so just wanted to put that out there I had to put that in sorry. I live for that. I mean, when are we going to be able to tell our story, the our version of that story, and make the money that we deserve to be made? I mean, we're we're getting there with pose. Mm -hmm. It's a step in the right mm -hmm. direction, mm -hmm. but we still got a long way to go. Nicole, oh, I'm getting an echo. Oh, Nicole, can you hear me? I sure can. What 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 what's 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 your word on this? How can we create an inter intergenerational system of joy? Yeah, you know, so one of the things that I do is I teach literary arts education to emerging up and coming storytellers. Um, and one of the things that I like to impart on them is stop celebrating and centering, and centering um, white awards, white acclaim. Um, stop looking for validation from Ooh. organizations who uh, set out to um, ignore at best and destroy um, in reality your existence, right? Um, or, you know, the literary uh, industry has always um, excluded Black, uh, queer, Latinx, indigenous, so forth, marginalized, underserved communities. Mm -hmm. um, so why do we keep, why do we keep praising them? <laughs> why do we keep like wanting to be um, a part of these establishments that mm -hmm. can't fucking stand us, but want all of our creativity to steal from us? So I think my first word would be to kind of like, let's, let's decolonize our minds a bit. Yeah. Let's stop running towards the white um, establishment for, so, you know, for credibility or for clap. Um, the second thing that I would say is once you have obtained um, some expertise in your genre, in your craft, mm -hmm. teach that shit. Yeah. Pass it on, right? Because I think, yes, um, Nasir, I agree with you. We definitely need to pull people up and bring them along with us as we climb. But shit, I want to give you your own motherfucking ladder. Come, come, come on. Come you know on. what I'm saying? Like, let's, let's, let's think about this comprehensively such that we're not constantly setting people up to depend Whoa. on us or anybody else, right? Yeah. Um, so I think those are the two things that I, that I would say to that. I am living for the idea of giving people the tools to mm -hmm. depend on themselves and the majesty of their own brilliance. I mm -hmm. Come on, Nicole. You better take a sip. Oh, my Lord. Somebody said, where's a church fan? My mother's Filipino. I have an Albanico <laughs> fan somewhere. We ain't, I can't find it now. But at some point, I may find it. But child, just know that it is metaphysically waving right now to just fan this truth and send it out there. We have one minute until we start this question and answer. So I have to say, if y'all haven't gotten y'all questions in yet, you have one minute to get them in. Where do we want to go? Okay, George, intergenerational mentorship and joy. How do we create that world? Come on, Pastor George. Oh God! Oh Lord! <laughs> oh Lord! We we we! we ciao, ciao, ciao. Um, no, honestly, it's it, uh, one of the things I had to realize was that um, the work that I was doing now and like what I'm writing now may not be for the 
may not only it's not only for the the, the kids who are here now like mm -hmm. the, the work that we are doing now the art that we are creating now it is for 50 years from now when i may not be here that somebody mm -hmm. can touch it grab it in a way that i didn't have the ability to do so right mm -hmm. um, for me it is how do you necessarily reach them sometimes sometimes you don't even have to say say a thing as much as you have to do a thing mm -hmm. um, I truly believe in the butterfly effect a, you know, it's like a butterfly flapped its wings somewhere and it created a hurricane, right? There are things that we just have to do and it's going to hit and touch and be read by somebody that we will never meet, never see, never know, never feel, but it is going to change their entire existence. Um, in many ways, it's simply just the acknowledgement that they exist, right? It's like, you'll have people, like, especially like with the book that I have out, like I have people who reach out to me. Sometimes it's just literally me double tapping that love mm. because that knows that this person acknowledged my existence mm. right i think sometimes we think like mentorship or like you said like certain things have to look like a big thing i i like to think of things macro level like what systems can i fix and i like to think of things micro level like whose life can i change today but because i did something mm. um, because I, I touched something because i i just acknowledged that you existed today mm. and that literally sometimes is just enough for for that person to keep going Sometimes that's just enough for that person to, you know, keep on pushing and, and, and keep on doing the things that they need to do. Um, when I think about just the intergenerational joy, um, sometimes it means that we have to push ourselves past the, our own boundaries because mm. we know that somebody's watching. Right? Mm. Um, it's the acceptance that visibility and representation is the starting point and not the ending point. A lot of people get get too, too caught up on like I made it. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That's the start. Like the fact that I get to be visible, that's the start. It's the acknowledgement that my generation is the blueprint generation of what Ooh. this looks like to live publicly queer, to have to have language, something that was also stolen from us. That is mm -hmm. what, what it is, right? And so it's the acknowledgement that I'm gonna make the mistakes and Nazir's gonna make the mistakes and Jordan's gonna make the mistakes and Nicole's gonna make the mistakes and you're gonna make the mistakes, but we make those mistakes and we make them publicly so that our next generation doesn't have to do the same thing. Um, I talk about, it's like, we will take the bullets and we will take the arrows so that y'all don't have to take them in the next generation, the same way that the ancestors before us did the same thing, but we didn't even know they were taking them because we didn't know they existed because you stole them. Mm -hmm. The difference now is we get to bear witness and we get to say, you harmed me. We get to publicly say, you did this to me. And we get to publicly on the other side of that say, I exist. These are my pronouns, mm. right? Thing, right? Like these are my pronouns. That's agency. So we get to live with agency. If I can exist with agency and say, "This is my agency. This is how you will address me. This is how I will identify. This is this," then that next generation already starts with the foundation of those things, something that was taken from us. And so that's literally how you give intergenerational joy because. I didn't get to go to prom with a boy, right? But I got to write about the fact that I didn't. And some 14 year old boy will read that and say, you know what? Because George didn't get to go to prom with a boy, I am gonna go to prom with a boy. Right? He sure did in it's Iowa City. In Iowa that. City. <laughs> it was, it, and it, but it's so simple as that because it's it's not always just about the mentoring. Or it's about the fact that I get to, 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 to name a thing and say a thing mm. publicly in a way that my ancestors couldn't say a thing publicly. And that sometimes is, is enough in a micro way for us to get that next generation where they need to go. Oh, now we're gonna get into some of these questions and I have been fielding them and looking through them and I, there's just so many places to start. But I think one of the ideas of creating a sustainable intergenerational system of black joy through black art is how do we make space to support black art and how do we make space to make it possible for black queer artists to make a living through their art and that's a question that came up on a couple of different threads over here and i've kind of conflated all of them into one so how can we make a living as black queer artists and how can we support other black queer artists? 
it starts from operating from a place of abundance and not a place of scarcity. Understanding yeah. how much we have to give in our community and knowing that even though we don't see them and we don't know them, there are folks in our community who have the resources and the skills that we need to be successful. And we have the skills and resources that other folks need to be successful. And so it's always about making that knowledge public and saying, how can I be in service as much as I am receiving? I think that something that I've learned from advocacy and working with girls that were incarcerated is the principle that my job is to make myself obsolete, is to give so much that I am no longer needed mm -hmm. and that I am the first and I die being the best, my job has not been done and I have failed. So how am I always making sure that I am working in service of others and sharing the resources that I have and the skills that I have and the knowledge that I have to enable other folks to move forward and move past me? I love that. I love the idea of moving towards obsolescence, the idea that we, we shouldn't be in a world where the work that we're doing is constantly in a type of survival mode, like what you're describing. I mean, the, the, the fact that we are, are having to use our work to advocate for our own humanity shows the intrinsic flaw in the society that, that brought us and 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 socialized us into the state. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna go where you. <laughs> I'm gonna go where you went. But that brings me to a question, which is that black queer art is multifaceted and multivalent, and sometimes we have to choose. How often do some of you feel that you have to choose? your blackness over your queerness or your queerness over your blackness, either on the page or in certain rooms when, where you're presenting yourself. Or you're, Nicole, go ahead. You already, come on. I was come on. Say that. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that, that, that I understand. So I understand um, the question. I understand the, the roots of the question. I don't yeah. mean to suggest that the question is, a ridiculous one because it is not. Oftentimes we've been forced, mm. um, <sighs> we've been forced by folks who are too ignorant to understand that our identities really are both and all of the things, right? Uh, folks have tried to force us to choose one thing over the other. So I understand mm -hmm. the foundation of the question, but I can't ever write just as a black person mm -hmm. and I can't ever write just as a woman and I can't ever just write as um, a queer person and I can't ever just write as a femme presenting person, right? All of, or a poverty born person, all of those identities are on the page when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Even if my story isn't about necessarily explicitly my blackness or explicitly mm -hmm. my queerness or explicitly my cis womanhood, right? That shit is all to the molecular cellular level in every sentence, period. I, I don't think we can choose. I'm yeah. so happy I'm that I'm so happy that we are in a place where what we can say is that one thing is slowly but surely fading into obsolescence, which is that we have to be one thing or the other. Someone is here saying intersectionality. You beat me to it. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say is at least we've taught them one lesson that we can be more than one thing and there can be more than one of us in the room and representing more than one identity politic at a time. So thank goodness we've done that much, you know, Go ahead. Well, I, want to, I, I want to take it even a step further because like, it's funny, like intersectionality describes, you know, like how we have intersections, but blackness is inherently queer. So it don't uh -huh. exist without queerness. So literally it's inherently queer, right? Because queer people exist within blackness. So that means that if you use the term blackness, I already, I'm there, you know? And I hate when people always do that. You got to be black first. Or it's, what are you talking about? Listen, Blackness is already inherently queer and to be black is to be queer because to be black was not to ever be accepted in this country in the first place and to be queer was to never not be accepted into whatever what the norm was in the first place. Mm -hmm. So literally to be black is to be queer. The problem is people think that queer only means sexuality only means gender specific. Right. No, queer just means different, right? And so if the norm in this country was always well the norm in this country won't always white folks today 
committed a genocide and then an enslavement. Right. Now, we started the talk with that, acknowledging the native lands. Right. We were all right. On, okay, right. However, once the norm was created that white was quote unquote the norm, black then was the queer. Oh. And then what existed within blackness were quote unquote queer people. And so uh -huh. again, to be again, to be black is already inherently queer. Mm. Because it was already, especially if we're talking about Black American statehood, it was already queer from the jump because mm. it was already not the quote unquote norm that was created in this society. And so, you know, intersectionality definitely gives us the nuance because then we can talk about the parts and the pieces. Mm. But when we are talking about Blackness, I'm sorry, my loves, it is already queer. Period. Like it is already right. queer. It already inherently has queerness in it. Right. There were queer people on the slave fields. There were queer people on the boats. There were queer, like we have already been here. And so there is no such thing as a blackness that doesn't already have a queerness that is already embodied within blackness. Right. And let's and let's not and let's not just acknowledge the effect of the the psycho religious uh, religiosity that tried to undo our inherent queerness, our inherent understanding of, of two-spiritedness, of, mm -hmm. uh, of what we would say same gendered love, which was already an inherent part of our tradition and our faith systems. Gatekeepers. Right, right. We were gatekeepers. Right, right. We can't even, we can't even, we can't even go forward until we understand the fact that these aspects of who we already were, were stripped and made shameful before we got off the boat. And during the time we got off, what, what, all of the, I think about the sodomizing practices of, mm -hmm. of, of the slave ship and how something that, something is turned into a punishment in order to make an example of a man or someone who's male presenting to show this is what happens to you when you buck me. So then that act, that act, which in and of itself is not a punishment, is now connoted as such. That is the scene of instruction from which queer shame begins. Mm. Ooh, Come Lord. on now. Let me go on to another Come question. Come on now. Let me go on to another question. I want to go back to Nasir. Nasir, you started us off talking about how great your day was. And one thing that I love is the idea of ritual. I love a good ritual and I love a good recounting of a ritual. Let us all chat a little bit about what are your rituals? What do you do to get prepared for writing and for the day? Mm. Uh, meditation, you know, just, just in, in, in making sure I don't check my phone in, at, at the very top of the day. You know what I mean? And, and not getting on social media, making sure that's not the first thing I do, making sure I, I sort of, uh, I sit with myself, I, I pray, I meditate. And as of lately, I've actually, I've been running a lot. I've been doing a lot mm -hmm. of since running. Um, and that's been helping me channel my energy during this quarantine, um, getting out a lot of the uh, rage that I feel, quite frankly, when I, when I watch uh, so much injustice happening and, and watch so much, um, foolishness happening in, throughout the world. And so uh, running has been such an incredible form of self-care. And, you know, and of course, like a good old therapy every Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. You know what I mean? Like just, you know, sitting on that call, on, on that chat with my therapist and just, and, and, and sometimes it's joyful, sometimes it's painful, sometimes I'm laughing, sometimes I'm crying. But uh -huh. whatever it is, I try my best to be present in that moment. And, um, and and honor myself by giving that to myself by showing up for myself in that way you know like so when i have either run or meditated or prayed or, or consulted with or, or worked with my therapist before 10 a.m it lets me know okay i showed up for myself today first and foremost mm -hmm. and now i can give to my job and now I can give to my writing and now I can give to my family because I paid myself first. I want to acknowledge that there are people on the thread right now who are thanking you for talking about therapy in a celebratory way. Mm -hmm. I just want to acknowledge that we need to celebrate black mental health mm -hmm. 
it is very important for us as Black queer people to understand and appreciate and hold space for our mental health needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, continue, please. I've been, it's, what's interesting, th thank you for saying that, and I, and I received that. I've been vocal about therapy for the past 10 years. Mm. And I've been in therapy, in and out, you know, sporadically throughout different times of my life since I was 16. So for the past, you know, for the past 19 years. And over the past 10 years, the dialogue went from being, well, you can just talk to me. If you want to talk so bad, pay me. And I'm like, for real? You know, what, what are they going to tell you that, that I can't tell you? And uh -huh. slowly, slowly but surely over these past five years, I'll say in particular, um, with Black folks as a whole, it's gotten much better. You know what I mean? It's gotten much more, you know, there's been a lot more understanding. There's been a lot more grace. There's been a lot more empathy of like, okay, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should give that a try. And then now what I'm starting to see now is a younger generation of, of black, of black folks, particularly black men who are like, well, 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 you know, maybe, maybe I'll make an appointment. You know, the, 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 the mind is starting to sort of be, be shaped and molded into, into having, having an understanding that it's a resource. It's a resource and it gives you a toolbox to understand why and how you're operating in the world the way that you are. Wow. You know, like, listen, once I realized I was calling my partner three times in a row because of my mommy issues, I was like, wait, hold on. It was like, wait, you're not being abandoned. What are you talking about? That's not real anymore. Wow. So you have to re you have to restructure the way your mind is operating, but that's been, you know, that's been a that's been a tool that therapy has given me and I'm forever grateful. So you have to restructure the way that your mind is operating. Listen, let me tell you, all I used to be I mean, that's that, that's the thesis of black I mean, that's the thesis of this whole conversation on black joy, mm -hmm. I feel. How do we restructure the way that our minds are operating so that we can turn other people's imposed pain and biases into our own self-defined joy. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. We have a really touching question. Someone said, decolonize our minds. You, you know that's what I'm saying. You know mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. A very touching question. And I, I, I feel this may be the last one because as I understand it, we're, we're done at, at the half hour. But I want to read this in its entirety. This is uh, from a professor. I am a professor, uh, a professional school counselor and LPC. I stand with my students with, who are queer, gender nonconforming, LGBTQIA, et cetera. And I'm constantly seeking therapists, artistic outlets, doctors. Where do, I, where do you suggest I start for people of color when there are so many white organizations present. Mm. This is, I thought this was interesting and it sort of segued from you, this last conversation to here. Anyone, any suggestions of organizations? I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm based here in LA. So there are, you know, I'm familiar with institutes like uh, the Black AIDS Institute, uh, the Ahmad Institute, um, you know, in the meantime, Los Angeles LGBT Center. Those are some of the things that I can just think off, off the top of my head. Um, and maybe perhaps that could be sort of a, a, a starting point to sort of guide, uh, to sort of help launch the journey of where that particular person is trying to get the proper resources. So, yeah. Thank you. Jordan, we had a question. If if you knew of any resources of therapy, maybe in the, on the New York side of things or the East Coast for, for folks. The Ochre Project has the Tony McDade and the Nita um, Pop Fund that provide one-time therapy to Black trans folks from a Black therapist. So if you connect with the Ochre Project, um, they'll be able to set you up with someone. And that one time doesn't have to be the end. It can be the beginning of a therapy journey for you. And they'll be able to help you navigate that. Wow. Now we're going to popcorn because we got one minute. But I want to get this question in real quick, OK? Maybe two or three words. What advice do you have for your fellow queer, trans, Black artists? And we'll go down the row. One or two words, maybe. Nicole. 
Oh man. Um, what advice do I have? Um, yeah. Live tenaciously. Love that. George. Oh God. What advice do I have? Um, write your truth. <laughs> Jordan. Face the impossible. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nasir. I think, um, I love you. Can I offer one, if I may? Please Go. do. Give freely and unconditionally. Mm -hmm. This has been a wonderful and soul-stirring evening. We have had a tremendous time talking about the road to Black joy. And I want to just give another hand to our guests. Nasir Faraby, Jordan J, George Johnson, Nicole Shawan Jr., our fabulous ASL team. I feel y'all. I mean, you should see. I mean, thank, thank you so much for being here and making this accessible to those who are receiving this information in different ways. From my heart to yours and everywhere in between, I, this has been a wonderful afternoon, evening. My name is Roger Q. Mason, and all I got to say is I love you madly. Thank you so much, and may the writing go on. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, panelists, for this incredible discussion. I'm going to go to bed feeling, having joy in my heart tonight, so thank you all. Um, and thanks for all the audience for coming out tonight. I hope you can join us at other events this week. You can find the full schedule at lambdaliterary.org. And if you have not made a donation yet tonight, you still can. Just start texting the code LITFEST to 44321. That's LITFEST to, to number 44321. Even giving it as little as $10 can ensure that we can keep bringing you programs like tonight's and months ahead and years ahead. So thank you all. Good night. Sleep tight. Good night. <laughs>